Employees most likely will not be motivated to help you achieve company goals unless they feel that they are properly compensated for their performance. Let's take a look at the purpose of compensation. This course is about how pay decisions are made and what you as a manager need to know to do to ensure that pay will attract, motivate, and retain employees. There are a number of questions that are important to consider when making compensation decisions, including the following. What factors should you consider when determining the salary range for a job? What is the best way to determine how much employees should be paid? And how much pay should be guaranteed and how much should be based on incentives? It's important for you to understand some of the theories related to compensation decisions as well as the mechanics of how those decisions are made. And it's equally important that you understand the legal implications of the decisions you make in compensation. Compensation refers to the monetary and non-monetary rewards employees receive in exchange for the work they do for an organization. In exchange for those rewards, employees are expected to be loyal and committed to their organizations. Direct compensation includes the hourly wages or salaries paid to employees, as well as any incentives, including merit raises and bonuses or commissions they receive. Indirect compensation includes the benefits and services employees receive, such as their health care insurance, vacation, lunches, company paid training programs, and other perks. This course focuses on direct compensation in terms of base pay and introduces the other components of the total compensation package. Over the past decade or so, many organizations have become to refer to total compensation packages they provide as total rewards. The word rewards is believed to better reflect the many aspects of a total compensation package – base pay, incentives, benefits, perks, and so forth – and to signal to employees that they are receiving more than just base pay. Some companies even include development and career opportunities in describing their total rewards. The goal behind this broad thinking is to motivate employees by helping them understand everything they are receiving from the organization in exchange for the work that they do. The key to a successful compensation plan is a compensation philosophy that supports the goals of the organization. A compensation philosophy communicates information to employees about what is valued to the organization, enhances the likelihood of consistency in pay across organizational units, and helps attract, motivate, and retain employees. A survey by World at Work, the professional association for compensation professionals, reported that 7 out of 10 organizations in a survey of 871 companies indicated that they had a written compensation philosophy. A clear idea of the compensation philosophy and its objectives enables a company to carefully construct a pay system that is aligned with the overall strategy of the organization, addresses internal alignment, external competitiveness, and employee contributions. When these factors are considered and the program is administered well, including communication to employees, the compensation program will assist the organization in achieving competitive advantage. Employees also perceive that their compensation reflects how they are valued by their employer and the people around them. Compensation, therefore, is very important to employees and serves as a motivator at work. According to equity theory, you and your employees will be motivated to work harder, provide inputs, when you believe that your compensation, the outcome received, is at the right level for the work that you're doing. If employees know, or just even believe, that they're not receiving an appropriate level of compensation for their work or their outcomes, they will experience disequilibrium. This disequilibrium, or inequity, can either be positive or negative. When the inequity is negative, employees believe that they're not getting as much out of their jobs as they're putting into them relative to other people. Faced with this situation, employees are likely to try to resolve the inequity. As a manager, you might not have much say about the actual pay structure within your organization. However, you are likely to have a great deal of input about how to reward your employees within that structure. 
Thus, it's important that you're aware of the importance of pay equity as you make recommendations for pay increases for your staff. To make matters more complicated, there are actually two labor markets in which inequities can exist. The labor market within your firm and the labor market outside your firm. Companies try to develop compensation systems that are equitable both internally and externally. Internal alignment occurs when each job in a company is valued appropriately relative to every other job in terms of its ability to help the firm achieve its goals. Traditionally, companies have established pay rates for jobs, not individuals performing the jobs. This point is important to remember as we examine the various types of job evaluation approaches used by organizations. We tend to think of pay rates as being established for employees rather than for the tasks they performed, but it's the other way around. With an internally aligned compensation plan, a relative worth structure is developed for jobs and then pay rates are assigned to those jobs. Before a company can begin to establish the relative worth of its jobs and the pay for each job, it must first have information available about the tasks, duties, and responsibilities required to perform each job. The information derived from a job analysis is vital for establishing the relative worth of jobs within a company through a systematic process called job evaluation. The four most common job evaluation approaches are job ranking, job classification, point factor, and factor comparison. The first two approaches, job ranking and job classification, are qualitative approaches. Point factor and factor comparison are quantitative approaches to job evaluation. Consider the importance of having a well-defined job description resulting from a careful job analysis before you can effectively apply any of the approaches of job evaluation. Job ranking involves reviewing job descriptions and listing the jobs in order from highest to lowest worth within the company. This process is fairly easy to do when there are only a few jobs in the company. Accurately ranking jobs in a large company is much more difficult than ranking jobs in a small company. If you only have five jobs to evaluate, you probably know the jobs well enough without even looking at the job description. But if you had to rank 25 jobs, could you do it? In this case, you'd be less likely to know a great deal about all of the jobs. Second, you would need some type of framework just to process all of the information you found in the 25 job descriptions. You would probably be able to decide which jobs were the most valuable and which jobs were the least valuable without too much trouble. However, you would likely find it difficult to evaluate the jobs that fall somewhere in the middle. Such a system is also more difficult to justify to employees because ranking jobs is largely subjective. That is, the order is just the manager's opinion about which jobs are more valuable to the firm than others. The job classification approach involves developing broad descriptions for groups of jobs that are similar in terms of their tasks, duties, responsibilities, and qualifications. Job descriptions for a particular job are then compared with the classification description and a decision is made about which description best fits the job. A wage range is attached to each classification, reflecting the relative worth of the jobs slotted into that classification. In the federal government, the classification levels are referred to by the prefix GS, which stands for General Schedule, followed by a number. Naturally, the pay range is higher for jobs with higher GS numbers than for those with lower numbers. More senior jobs fit into an entirely separate pay schedule. Sometimes, managers want to reclassify jobs so they can give a particular employee who merits it a large raise or because the job duties have changed. The managers can then compare the revised job description to the classification guide to determine which grade that job falls. The classification description can also be used as inputs for preparing the new job description. 
One criticism of the job classification system is that the parts of the job being evaluated might fit into one job grade in the system whereas other parts might fit into another grade. A decision then has to be made about which classification is most appropriate. Because the pay range will differ depending on the decision, the outcome of the evaluation process is extremely important. The most commonly used type of job evaluation is the point method, sometimes referred to as the point factor method. This quantitative approach to job evaluation uses a point value scheme that yields a score for each job. The scores for various jobs are then compared to determine their relative worth. The point method is developed by first identifying a set of factors for which the company is willing to pay. These compensable factors are chosen because they represent aspects of jobs that a company needs in order to achieve its goals. Typically, companies use compensable factors such as skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions, but they can add other factors such as innovativeness. Remember that we are focusing on evaluating a job, not a person performing a job, so compensable factors should be elements that appear in varying degrees across many jobs within a company. With the point method, a point manual is used to determine the relative worth of jobs. The point manual contains a general description of each compensable factor along with a description of each degree of the factor. Once the point manual is ready, job descriptions for benchmark jobs can be compared with the factor descriptions, and the appropriate points can be assigned for the jobs. Benchmark jobs are used to represent a range of jobs in the company. These jobs need to be stable over time in terms of their responsibilities, well known and recognized, clearly and concisely described, accepted in the external labor market for setting wages, and compensated at an appropriate wage rate. The points assigned for each factor are added together into a score for the job. This score provides a way to compare jobs with each other to determine which jobs should be paid more and which less. Often this process is conducted by a compensation committee to ensure that the results are reliable and valid. As you can see, the point method brings more objectivity to the job evaluation process. The key to its success is threefold, properly identifying the compensable factors and selecting the benchmark jobs, assigning appropriate weights to each factor, and accurately using the point manual. Once the points are assigned, job grades are created to reflect the hierarchy of jobs within a company. Jobs with comparable points are grouped together to create job grades. A company may have one job grade plan for all jobs. Typically, however, a company develops different structures for professional, technical, and other categories of jobs such as clerical and skilled trade jobs. Non-benchmark jobs can then be evaluated and slotted into the hierarchy. Factor comparison is a quantitative type of job evaluation that involves ranking benchmark jobs in relation to each other on each of several factors, such as mental requirements, physical requirements, skill, responsibility, and working conditions. A determination is then made about how much of the hourly rate for a job is associated with each factor. The factor comparison approach is actually a hybrid method for job evaluation that combines aspects of job ranking and the point method, but it also breaks down the wage into smaller parts. Unfortunately, although this method can be quite accurate, it's also quite complex and would be challenging to explain to managers and employees. Managers also need extensive training to properly use the method, and because monetary rates are included, as the market changes the rate, the plan has to be updated frequently. As a result, the factor comparison approach is used less often than other approaches of job evaluation. External competitiveness ensures that jobs in a company are valued appropriately relative to similar jobs in the company's external labor market. Companies make decisions about what they want to pay relative to the external market, and these decisions affect how attractive the firm is to potential employees. 
They also affect the attitude and motivation of current employees. Salary surveys provide a systematic way to collect information about wages in the external labor market. Managers can either conduct their own surveys or purchase survey data from a number of different sources, including professional organizations and human resource consulting firms. If you decide to purchase data, it's important to ask a lot of questions about the process used to collect the data, including the types of organizations included and the jobs analyzed. Typically, salary survey data will come from companies in the same industry. For many jobs, it's also important to collect data from companies in other industries that might be competing with you for employees. The data should also come from the appropriate geographic labor market, which can be local, regional, national, or global, depending on the type of job. Salary surveys should collect data for an organization's benchmark jobs because it would be too expensive and time-consuming to try to collect data for every job in the company. Plus, there will be jobs in your organization for which there are no comparable jobs in other organizations. Job pricing is the systematic process of assigning monetary rates to jobs so that a firm's internal wages are aligned with the external wages in the marketplace. It is during this process that an organization's pay policy relative to the market is developed. Job pricing is a multi-step process. It begins with managers plotting the results of a salary survey for the benchmark jobs within their firm. To illustrate how the external data translates into internal compensation decisions, we will assume that managers are using the point method to evaluate jobs. The x-axis represents the evaluation points associated with different jobs that are used to map their importance to the firm. The y-axis represents the salaries the external labor market is paying for those jobs. The result of combining the data for the jobs is a scatter plot as seen here. Notice that you can almost draw a straight line from the bottom left corner to the top right corner of the graph. In fact, this is what actually happens. The market line, also known as the wage curve, which may be a straight line but is more likely to be curved, is drawn to represent the relationship between the job evaluation points and the salaries paid for the jobs. The wage curve can be drawn by hand through the points so that about as many points are above the line as are below the line, or a statistical regression process can be used to draw the line. The regression approach is, of course, most accurate. Any differences between the wages the company is paying and the wages being paid in the marketplace are noted. In short, the wage curve shows how similar the pay within the firm's job structure is to how jobs are being paid in the labor market. The next step is to plot the actual salaries for the benchmark jobs in the company and compare that result with the results from the market. Once again, the job evaluation points are used, but this time the salaries are the actual salaries in the company for the benchmark jobs used in the survey. The difference between the company wages and the wages paid in the market provides information about how the company is currently paying for those benchmark jobs relative to the pay in the labor market. The company's pay policy will determine what is done and is driven by the strategic objectives of the firm's compensation philosophy and policies. Companies can choose to pay at the market, follow, above the market, lead, or below the market, lag. Many firms, however, decide to pay at the market. Executives believe that if their company pays above the market, it might be incurring unnecessary labor expenses. In contrast, if a company pays below the market, it might have a harder time attracting new employees. Some firms choose to pay at the market but offer benefits that exceed what is typically offered for comparable work at other companies. An additional approach is to match as many jobs as possible to the market. This approach is used when a company's main focus is on external competitiveness rather than internal alignment. Employees in a particular job should not be paid less than the minimum amount of the pay range, nor more than the maximum amount of the range. To establish pay ranges, managers decide which jobs are similar according to the job evaluation results and group those jobs into grades. 
the jobs in each pay grade will have the same pay range. Each pay grade will have a minimum and a maximum number of job evaluation points which appear on a horizontal axis, as well as a minimum and maximum wage rate which would appear on a vertical axis. When establishing wage ranges, an important consideration is the degree of overlap. A small amount of overlap between two grades means that there is a great deal of difference between the salaries paid for the two jobs. In other words, less overlap means that there is more difference between jobs in each grade. The overlap decision is affected by the nature of the job, clerical versus professional as an example, and other factors, such as what the firm wants to signal to employees in terms of upward mobility. When there's a lot of overlap, employees in lower grades might actually have the same salary as employees in a higher grade. Thus, internal equity as well as external equity is a concern in determining the overlap of pay ranges. Grades and ranges give managers some degree of flexibility when it comes to compensating employees who have different amounts of seniority, skills, and productivity levels. For example, an employee with one year of experience who is still learning the job would be paid lower within the same pay range than someone with five years of experience and a high level of performance. Once the pay grades are determined, non-benchmark jobs can be evaluated and slotted into the appropriate pay grades. Most likely, you'll be given guidance from a human resource professional regarding how to set the salary for your employees appropriately within their pay grade range. An approach that's worked well for some organizations is broadbanding, also known as career banding. Broadbanding consolidates a large number of pay grades into a few broad bands, usually 3 to 10 bands or grades, as opposed to a larger number traditionally used. The maximum pay for a particular band can be as high as 100 to 400 percent above the band's minimum pay. The jobs in the band are similar to one another in that they require approximately the same level of education and experience as well as have similar levels of responsibility. Reducing the number of grades by using bands makes managing the system much easier too because the bands are typically wide enough that changes in the market don't require managers to adjust the bands as frequently. Another plus for broadbanding is that the pay range for the band gives you, as a manager, more flexibility to set the starting pay for one of your employees and more room for you to give raises to your existing employees without going outside the band. When bands are used, it's important to ensure that there is some logical reason why jobs are in the same band. Managers also need to understand how bands work and how to properly assign salaries within bands. If this training does not happen, employees might believe that the company's salary decisions aren't based on objective criteria. Also, the flexibility in pay ranges afforded by bands can lead to higher wages overall for the company if processes are not in place to manage how increases are instituted. Skill-based pay and knowledge-based pay systems require employees to acquire certain skills or knowledge in order to receive a pay increase. The skills or knowledge are arranged in a hierarchy. An employee demonstrates mastery of each level of skill or knowledge by passing a test, passing a class, or serving in an apprentice role. Once the level has been passed, the employee receives a pay raise. These plans can be classified as depth-oriented or breadth-oriented plans. Depth-oriented plans focus on the employee gaining greater expertise or depth on existing skills. Breath-oriented plans focus on employees gaining flexibility to perform a variety of jobs in the company while developing skill depth and management skills. The goals of both of these pay plans is to ensure that a sufficient number of employees have the skills and knowledge an organization needs to succeed. The process also makes it clear to employees what they have to do to increase their pay. These pay systems are not without problems, however. Some companies have found that they end up with more employees at higher levels of mastery than they need, and employees may become frustrated because they can't use the skills they've acquired. The outcome is oftentimes expensive. 
However, survey and academic research suggest that the benefits of skill-based plans outweigh the costs in the right settings, primarily in manufacturing and service jobs. Such plans have been associated with ensuring firms have the critically needed skills that may be infrequently used but increase productivity, lower labor costs, and do it with fewer employees. In comparison with job-based and market-based pay plans, researchers found that skill-based plans were superior. Competency-based pay is a highly structured pay system that identifies the competencies employees need to master to be eligible for pay raises. When competencies are identified for the firm as a whole or for a particular work unit, and they are the competencies that are believed to be the most critical if the firm is to achieve its goals. Employees receive higher compensation when they demonstrate that they have a higher level of the competencies valued by the company. For a competency-based system to be successful, managers need to clearly define the competencies employees need to have and outline a valid process for determining whether they have them. The disadvantages of a competency-based plan are similar to those for skill-based pay. Employees can obtain more competencies than their current jobs merit, leading to higher labor costs for a firm, and they can become frustrated because they aren't using the additional training to advance within the organization. Market pricing involves collecting salary information from the external labor market first, rather than starting with the development of an internal structure based on the value of jobs within the company. Data are collected on as many jobs as possible, with the remaining jobs included in the final pay structure. This approach came into vogue in the late 1980s, in part because jobs were changing rapidly and the use of technology became more prevalent. Market pricing was the dominant approach used for job evaluation by companies participating in a World at Work survey in 2015. The approach works well as long as the data is accurate. Ignoring small sample sizes and other measurement problems can lead to incorrect inefficiencies about actual market pay rates for a particular job. A problem with base pay is that it ties the firm to fixed dollar amounts that becomes larger as cost of living adjustments and merit pay are added to the base. So, before we discuss the compensation mix further, we need to discuss the concepts of cost of living adjustment and merit increases. These are two common methods of increasing employee base pay. As a result of inflation, many firms give their employees a cost of living adjustment, known as COLAs, to offset the increases in the prices of goods and services they purchase and keep salaries from lagging behind the external market. The Consumer Price Index, or CPI, is used as the basis for determining the amount of a COLA. Merit increases are not automatic. They're awarded based on how well an individual has performed. Like a COLA, however, a merit increase permanently raises a person's wages. Even if the worker's performance declines, the previous merit increase still remains as part of his or her base pay. To offset the permanency of merit increases, quite a few firms are increasing the amount of variable pay they offer to employees. In fact, a lot of managers believe that offering employees more variable versus based pay can effectively shape their behavior. Variable pay can include bonuses, commissions, stock options, and other forms of monetary rewards that do not become a permanent part of a person's base pay. Overall, a company's strategy will determine the mix of base pay and variable pay and the mix of monetary and non-monetary rewards it offers. If employees believe there is distributive justice, they might be less concerned about procedural justice. Typically, however, employees want to understand that both the process and the outcomes of compensation are fair. Employees know, even if they get a good outcome, such as a good raise this time, that might not happen next time around if the process is poorly designed. In addition, interactional justice is important. 
If an employee feels that he doesn't have a good relationship with you as his manager, he will be concerned about the fairness of the decisions you make, including those that relate to his compensation. Therefore, as a manager, it's your responsibility to make sure that your employees understand the pay process and how their pay was determined and that they know that you are treating them fairly. Salary compression, also referred to as pay or wage compression, and salary inversion are additional fairness issues. Salary compression occurs when the pay for jobs in the external marketplace rises faster than the pay for jobs inside the organization so that new employees are making the same wages as current employees. Salary inversion happens when new employees negotiate for even higher wages than the current employees are making. When firms decide to make salary adjustments for a job to address equity issues, they have to decide whether all of the longer-term employees in that particular job should be raised to the market level or not. Doing so implies that these employees would be able to obtain new jobs in the marketplace at market wages. A living wage is the concept that employees should be paid a wage that ensures that their basic costs of living are met. Much controversy surrounds this concept, however, because of the differences in opinion that exist about what minimal amount of income would constitute a living wage, and about whether it's the employer's obligation to ensure that employees make a living wage. Employers must pay the legally mandated minimum wage, but they may have difficulty with the idea that they have to pay more than that for low-skilled jobs. A few local governments have been able to enact a living wage legislation. Nassau County, New York, has a living wage of $15.78 per hour, or $13.73 per hour with health benefits for county employees and businesses with contracts with the county over $25,000. They've had a living wage law in effect since 2007. Comparable worth has been another hotly debated topic. Comparable worth focuses on eliminating the gender inequity in wages because jobs held by women traditionally have been underpaid relative to similar jobs held by men. With comparable worth, jobs in the organization would be valued relative to other jobs within the organization, regardless of whether they're traditionally male jobs or female jobs. This process ensures the value to the company is the driver in establishing wages rather than the labor market being the determinant. Minnesota, which has enacted comparable worth legislation for state and local government, does a regular analysis to determine what inequities still exist between male and female jobs. An inequity exists when female employees are being paid less than males even though their job evaluation ratings indicate that they should be paid at least equally. Also, the differences cannot be explained by performance issues or length of service issues. The January 2014 analysis showed that 99% of local governments were in compliance. Previously, females were paid 81% of the wages paid to men in jobs with comparable job evaluation ratings. The inequities most often found are between city clerks and maintenance workers. As you can imagine, the idea of comparable worth only has had limited success. Employers are concerned with the added direct labor costs associated with reclassifying jobs. The Equal Pay Act only requires equal pay for jobs that are substantially the same. Minimum wage is the lowest hourly wage that an employer can pay to workers. At the time of this course, most employees in the United States were entitled to a federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour. This rate became effective July 24, 2009. In August 2016, 27 states plus the District of Columbia already had higher minimum wages than the federal minimum wage. The minimum wage in the state of Washington, as an example, is $9.47 per hour. Connecticut's increase will be to $10.10 .10 by 2017, and the District of Columbia has set a minimum hourly wage of $10.50 an hour. The cities of Portland, San Diego, New York, and a few others have worked to increase the minimum wage for the city. 
However, the state of Oklahoma passed a law preventing cities and towns from raising the local minimum wage. There are some exceptions to minimum wage requirements. People, for example, under the age of 20 can be paid less than the minimum wage during their first 90 consecutive days of employment. Employees who receive more than $30 in tips per month may be required by their employer to count their tips as wages under the FLSA requirements. Exempt employees do not receive overtime pay for the hours worked over 40 in a work week. Non-exempt employees receive overtime pay for hours worked in excess of 40 hours in a work week. Executive, administrative, professional, and outside sales employees who receive salaries are typically considered to be exempt employees. Non-exempt employees who work more than 40 hours in a week are considered to be working overtime and are entitled to receive pay at the rate of 1.5 times their regular rate of pay for that additional time. The distinction between what constitutes an exempt employee versus a non-exempt employee is actually quite complex, however. 